Hi, and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases, and UK true crime. Today we're going to explore the case of the murders of Harry and Meghan Twos in South Wales in 1993. The brutal execution-style murders of an elderly couple shocked the nation. However, their murders still remain unsolved, despite a controversial arrest and subsequent appeal. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. The village of Lanharry is located in the borough of Rhondda on Taff in South Wales. The village is historically part of Glamorgan and is a relatively small place, being around 14 miles from the city of Cardiff and around 21 miles from the city of Newport. Lanharry was traditionally linked with mining, and many of the local jobs revolved around that. However, when the village gained access to the M4 motorway, it meant that more people were able to visit nearby towns and cities, and also meant that people could visit the village. Harry and Meghan Twos had lived on their 10-acre farm, Tiariwan, just outside Lanharry, for many years, and had raised their daughter Cheryl there. The couple had both been born in mid Glamorgan, and the farm had been in Meghan's family for over a century. The couple took on the farm wholeheartedly, and it was a life that they both enjoyed. It needed a lot of upkeep, however it was something that both Harry and Meghan were used to, and Harry owned his own market garden business and ran it from the farm. He grew many plants and vegetables there and would sell them to locals and businesses. He took a lot of pride in his job and worked hard to produce the best plants that he could. In 1986, Harry decided to retire in his late fifties, and the couple began to take life a little easier. That same year, their daughter Cheryl also decided to leave home and start a life of her own. Harry and Meghan were now living alone and starting a new chapter in their lives during retirement. Over the next seven years, Harry and Meghan's life was uneventful. They led quite a quiet life and had become accustomed to a daily routine. The pair would have breakfast together, read the newspaper, go to the supermarket and pick up their pensions from the post office. This was a routine that many people that knew the couple were used to and their neighbours and friends would often see them out and about. It seemed that Monday the 26th of July 1993 was not going to be any different to this. The events are not entirely known, however police were later able to put together a basic timeline for that day. Harry and Meghan got up as usual and had breakfast together at the farm. At around 9.30am, the couple got into the car to travel into Lanharry to pick up their pensions. When they arrived at the village, Harry got out and went into the shop to collect their pension money and Meghan stayed in the car. Soon after, the pair made their usual trip to the local supermarket, Tesco. They had been shopping there for 15 years, and like many other aspects of their life, had made it their routine. Harry would usually stay in the car, while Meghan went in to get the shopping. While she was in the supermarket, Harry would often bump into one of his sisters, and the two would have a chat while he waited. It was known that the couple didn't spend long at the supermarket as at around 11am one of their neighbours was pulling out of the road when she spotted them going over the cattle grid and down the lane towards their house. These events were very normal for the couple and the day seemed to be going as it usually did. Several hours went by and as the afternoon began to turn into evening neighbours heard something unusual from the two's house. The phone was ringing and ringing, and it didn't sound as though there was anyone there to pick it up. The strange thing was, however, the car was still there, and nobody had seen Harry and Meghan leave again that day. As the ringing continued, neighbours grew worried for the couple, who knew that this was very out of character for them. It's reported in Wales Online that one of the neighbours, farmer Owen Hopkins, rang Cheryl explaining that he believed something might be wrong. For this reason, the police were called out to the house to check on them and the situation. When officers arrived at the farm, they were also greeted by a strange sight. The couple were nowhere to be found in the home. The house looked as though it had just been abandoned in the middle of a normal day. The front door was unlocked and there were three cups out. 
a cup that would later be identified as Harry's on the kitchen table, and Megan's in the kitchen. There was a third teacup and saucer also sat on the table, suggesting that the couple had had a visitor that afternoon. Police also found what looked to be a half-prepared lunch in the kitchen, as though something had stopped them while they were in the middle of getting it ready. Aside from this, however, the police did not find anything else odd or suspicious in the home, and everything seemed to be where it should have been. Nothing was in disarray or missing. That was except Harry and Meghan themselves. Officers extended their search to the rest of the land and outbuildings that the couple owned, in the hope that this would give them some idea as to where they may have gone. It was when police entered a cow shed on the property that they discovered Harry and Meghan. Their bodies were found underneath bunches of hay in the cow shed, and it was later confirmed that they had both been shot in the head. This was a completely unexpected situation for the police to encounter, as on first glance it looked as though the couple had simply gone somewhere, as their house had been left exactly as it was when they were in there that afternoon. The police immediately cordoned off the scene and set about trying to identify anything unusual at the home and collect any evidence. The one thing that quickly stood out to the officers was the third cup that was sat on the twos' kitchen table. This indicated that the couple had had a visitor that day, and that this person may not have been entirely unknown. It was later confirmed by Detective Superintendent Colin Jones on a Crime Watch segment about the murders that this particular teacup was usually kept on a shelf, and that the couple did not drink from it themselves. The indications appeared to be that the cup was for special occasions, or when they had a visitor. This was a lead early on in the investigation, and during the episode, Detective Superintendent Jones explained that this may well have been an innocent visitor to the home that day, and may not have been anyone involved with the crime. For this reason, he asked that the person come forward so that they could be eliminated from the inquiries. The other reason why this mystery visitor was so crucial was because it appeared that there was no sign of forced entry to the home. It did not seem that whoever had committed the crimes had broken into the house, or had any motivation to rob the Tooses. Therefore it was assumed that whoever had been in the house that day must have been invited in, suggesting that they were in some way known to the couple. Another piece of information also made its way to police. They discovered that around a year before the murders, Harry's shotgun had been stolen from their home. Harry often used the gun to scare away rabbits that would come onto his land and eat his plants. This information was important as it was later established that the couple had been shot with a 12-bore shotgun. Officers began searching for the possible murder weapon and Detective Superintendent Jones told the public that they were also very interested in locating Harry's stolen shotgun. Neighbours would later provide more crucial information about gunshots that they heard that day. They told police at around 1.30pm they had heard gunshots coming from the Tooze's house. They had, however, not thought anything of it at the time, as it was a regular occurrence to hear shots as Harry did own a shotgun. They just believed at the time that Harry had been shooting, and it wasn't until the discovery of the bodies that neighbours realised what they heard may be in some way connected. Police gave out quite a detailed description of Harry's shotgun that had been stolen. It had a broken stock and the right arm of the mechanism was damaged. It also had a string attached to the trigger mechanism. It had quite a sharp barrel with two or three inches that had been taken off it. It also had a brass plate on it under the stock which had the initials BJ inscribed on it. It was hoped that if they could locate Harry's gun they could either rule out its importance to the case or continue to investigate it. An appeal was made for anyone who had visited the house, or anyone that knew the couple to come forward, as they may be able to help produce a better picture of the couple's life. Police also asked witnesses to come forward, if they saw anyone in the area at the time, or any cars that they thought should be investigated further. They even asked for anyone that may have heard any rumours about what happened to tell the police. It was clear that they were at somewhat of a loss to explain what had happened to Harry and Meghan. There was no apparent motive, and the couple's life did not give them any indications as to why someone would want to kill them. They led a quiet life without issues, 
and therefore the question of who would want to murder them in such a cold-blooded way was a mystery. It was also a huge shock for the local community, who knew Harry and Meghan to be quiet but friendly people, and the couple's daughter Cheryl also had to come to terms with what had happened to her parents. The village of Lanharry was not used to such violent crime. It's reported in Wales Online that there had only been one break-in reported there in the previous 60 years. The fact that an elderly couple had been gunned down in their own home was unimaginable, and scared many of the local residents. In the same Wales Online article, it's reported that a villager named Sheila Rees stated, I used to walk through the woods near the farmhouse to pick bluebells, but I won't be going out on my own again until they find the killer. This was the general feeling in the area at the time, and the police continued to try and find out as much as they could about the possible perpetrator. Just a week after the murders it's reported in the Liverpool Echo newspaper, the officers staged a reconstruction of that day, in the hope that it may lead them to some answers. The police also parked the couple's Land Rover up close to the post office to jog villagers' memories of that day, as it was known that they had been to pick up their pensions that morning. Sixty officers were dispatched to interview shoppers in the area about that day. Detective Superintendent Jones told the press, The couple regularly use the post office, so it's possible that they spoke to other customers there. We need to speak to everyone who was in contact with them a week ago. It was known in that first week the community came together to pray at the local church that Harry and Meghan attended, and the couple's daughter Cheryl made an appeal to the public for their help to find out who killed her parents. Despite public appeals, a month went by without any further progress being made. At the end of August, police made another public appeal, this time a poster appeal for Harry's missing gun. It's reported in the Aberdeen Press and Journal that antiques and firearms dealers were also given information about the gun in case it had ended up being sold or given away. Over the next several months, police continued to appeal for more information and the murders appeared on Crime Watch. It's believed that hundreds of tips had been called in to police, however the murders remained unsolved, causing further grief to the family and to the tight-knit community in Lanharry. At the beginning of December, there was a big development in the case. National newspapers suddenly ran the story that a suspect had been arrested for the murders. The identity of this suspect surprised many people close to the two's family. 33-year-old Jonathan Jones was brought before Pontypridd Magistrates Court for the murders of the couple. The shocking part about it, however, was that Jonathan Jones was Cheryl Toos's boyfriend. Jonathan and Cheryl had been together for eight years in 1993, after meeting on a business studies course at the Polytechnic of Wales. They lived together in Orpington in Kent in 1993. Those that knew the couple later stated that both Cheryl and Jonathan were close to Harry and Meghan and that they got on well. Why then did the police believe that he had anything to do with their murders? At his initial appearance at the Magistrate Court, it's reported that Jones made no plea to the charges. It wasn't until 1995, however, that he would face trial, and the evidence against him became known. The 12-week trial took place at Newport Crown Court, and was presided over by Mr Justice Rougier. The prosecution laid out their theory on the case and Jones's guilt. They stated that he had travelled from his home in Kent to Lanharry to see Harry and Meghan. He had first had a cup of tea with the couple, before killing them in the cowsheds and covering it up. The evidence for this was that his left thumbprint had been found on the cup and the saucer, indicating that he had in fact been there and used the cup. This had always been a crucial part of the evidence for police. In relation to the motive for the crime, the prosecution attested that Jonathan and Cheryl were in financial difficulty and that Jonathan knew that Cheryl would be the sole beneficiary to her parents' £150,000 inheritance. It's reported in the Newcastle Journal that the couple were regularly in arrears with their rent and that Jonathan was in the process of setting up a market research company. This, they said, he was planning to do with only £100 in the bank. 
The prosecution also stated that Jones had made up an alibi for the day of the murders, telling Cheryl that he was browsing estate agents looking for rented offices for his new business. The prosecution alleged, however, that no estate agents remembered seeing Jones that day, that this had been an attempt to set himself up an alibi. The defence, however, pointed out that aside from the thumbprint, there was no other evidence against Jones at the scene. There was no forensic evidence found in his car or in his clothes to tie him to the murders, or even any other evidence at the house to suggest that he'd been there on that particular day. It was also pointed out that the murder weapon was never found, and could also not be linked to Jones. Both Jones and Cheryl made statements to the court, with Jones giving evidence in his own defence. He told the court that he was like a son to Harry, and, quote, we spent a lot of time together, and I think we had a close relationship, as close as it could be. Cheryl told the court that she believed in Jonathan's innocence, saying, If I thought Jonathan was guilty, I would say so. I wouldn't protect him over this. Jones denied all allegations that were put to him and stated his innocence. At the end of the trial, the jury went to deliberate and spent two days coming to a decision. When they returned to court, it was found that they'd come to a verdict by a 10-2 majority. They'd found Jonathan Jones guilty of both murders. Mr Justice Rougier sentenced Jones to two concurrent life sentences, saying, It was the planned and pitiless execution of a harmless couple who should have had nothing from you except your affection and respect. It's reported that as Jones was led away from the court, he shook his head. It appeared that the perpetrator had been caught, and some in the community were relieved that the case may finally be coming to a close. Even some of the Two's family believed that the police had caught the right man. It's reported in the Newcastle Journal that one of Meghan's cousins stated, We all believe it was the right verdict. Harry and Meghan have had justice at last. Cheryl, however, continued to believe that Jonathan had nothing to do with her parents' murders, and she and Jonathan proclaimed his innocence to anyone that would listen. Cheryl began a campaign to convince the public that Jonathan had nothing to do with it, and it's reported in the Aberdeen Press and Journal that she offered a £25,000 reward for information about the real killer or killers. Over the next year, Jones was in prison, however was appealing the court's ruling. During this time, however, there was a development which gave Jones some hope that others also believed in his innocence. It's reported in Wales Online that Mr Justice Rougier, who presided over the trial, had written a letter to the Home Secretary. In this letter, Rougier explained that he was very surprised that the jury had convicted Jones, and that if he was guilty, he must be very cunning. He expressed that he had significant doubts about the conviction. This gave Jones and his legal counsel a renewed hope that an appeal may be successful. In April 1996, his lawyers, including Mr John Rees QC, put forward their appeal, asking the court to consider five new points in the case. Rees stated that he believed that Jones's conviction was based on suspicion, speculation and conjecture. He later told the Court of Appeal that the way in which the couple were killed would mean that the perpetrator would have been covered in blood and brain tissue, and that the police had found no forensic evidence to link Jones to the crime. He also told the court that the prosecution had not even proved that Jones was in the area at the time, and that it could not be established that he had used a train to get to Lan Harry that day, which is what was alleged. Rees stated that a man had reportedly been seen in a trench coat at Ponty Clun train station, which was allegedly Jones. However, three witnesses told police that it was not him. Jones's defence lawyers also pointed out that the prosecution had established no real motive for the murders, and that the relationship between Jones and the couple was deemed to be good by those that knew him. It took four days for the Court of Appeal to hear the evidence, and at the end of this, the three judges, Lord Justice Rose, Mr Justice Dyson and Mr Justice Gage Crown, all came to the same decision. Jonathan Jones's conviction was deemed unsafe. They stated that there was a clear view that these convictions were unsafe on reasons that we shall give on a future occasion. Jones was allowed to be released immediately from prison. 
He told reporters on his release, I'm delighted to be free. I had never given up hope. My life in prison has been horrendous. Cheryl also spoke to the press about standing by Jones while he was in prison, saying, It's a victory of love and truth. I think the legal system has a lot to answer for. I would like to help other victims of miscarriages of justice. After Jones' release, the judges gave some reasons for his acquittal, and some of these related to leads that had not been followed up on by the police investigation. It's reported in the Aberdeen Press and Journal in May 1996 that these included sightings of four-wheel drive vehicles near the farmhouse, noisy arguments and a mystery middle-aged man seen with the twosies. Despite the fact that the judges believed that there were lines of inquiry that had not been followed up on, South Wales Police issued a statement shortly after Jones's release, saying that they were not planning on reopening the investigation. Both Jonathan and Cheryl were appalled by this statement, and in response Jonathan told the public, It's now time that the police got off their backsides and reopened the investigation. The judges mentioned a whole host of leads which were never followed up on. I don't think the inquiry was ever completed. It was superficial. Jonathan and Cheryl told newspapers at the time about how the conviction had affected them. The couple had had a baby boy, and due to the stress of the trial, Cheryl had suffered a rare condition during her pregnancy, which meant that the cartilage in her body wasted away. After the birth of their son, she still struggled to walk without support, and her hearing had also been affected. Despite these personal issues, the couple continued to appeal to the public to reopen the investigation into the murders. In May 1996, South Wales Police issued another statement to say that the case was not closed. Assistant Chief Constable Bob Evans told the press, We wish to re-emphasise that we will rigorously follow up any new information which may come to light in respect of these murders. In September 1996, it was reported that a documentary had been aired on ITV about the murders. The show, The Big Story, named two men who allegedly gave misleading statements to police after arriving at the scene at the farmhouse. Police said that they would be looking closely at the tapes from the show to see if they contained any new evidence, however they were not reopening the inquiry at that time. Years passed and no new information appeared to be coming out about Harry and Meghan's case until 2000 when two reviews of the case were set up. These reviews were led by retired Detective Superintendent Malcolm Ross from West Midlands Police and another by an independent advisory group. The next year, in 2001, a reinvestigation was officially launched into the murders and police once again began actively following up leads. This did unearth some new information. It's reported in the Western Mail that in 2002, an anonymous letter was sent to police regarding the murders. Detective Chief Inspector Trevor Evans told the public that the letter contained interesting information, but did not divulge anything more. He did appeal for the writer to get in touch with police again. In February 2003, another discovery was made. The barrels of a 12-bore shotgun and cartridges were discovered in a quarry not far from the couple's home, along with a hold all which had been found in a flooded iron ore mine close by. This was a significant discovery as it appeared to be the same type of shotgun that had been stolen from the Toosies' home a year before their deaths. The items were sent off for DNA analysis. Detective Chief Inspector Evans stated about this discovery, We are keeping an open mind about the discovery of the holdall, shotgun cartridges and barrel and are not discounting the possibility that they could be connected with the murder of Harry and Meghan Twos. We need the public's help together with forensic tests to find out as much as we can about them and how and when they ended up in the area. We are urging anyone with information about who they may have belonged to or who may have discarded them to contact us. In 2003, it was also announced that detectives who had worked on the Lynette White case had joined the team working on Harry and Meghan's murders. Lynette White was 21 when she was murdered in Cardiff in 1988. Five men were charged with her murder and three were convicted in 1990, in the longest murder trial in the UK at the time. It was later found that none of the scientific evidence from the scene 
linked to any of the three men, and in 1992 their convictions were ruled as unsafe. In 2004, when DNA was retested, it led police to the actual killer, a man named Geoffrey Gaffor. This was a notorious miscarriage of justice case which led to the longest police corruption trial in British criminal history and saw eight police officers charged with perverting the course of justice, but later acquitted when the trial fell through. The team of detectives that had been crucial in tracking down Geoffrey Gaffor were now working on the Tooze's case. It was hoped that this would eventually lead to another suspect. This was hopefully going to be found through extensive DNA testing, including on the gun barrel and holdall that had been discovered. The inquiry into the murders continued, however by 2006 there was still no significant progress that had been made. It was announced that year that the police were looking into two vehicles that had been seen in the area at the time, a black 4x4 and a red saloon car. Extra officers were assigned to the case, however by 2008, nothing further had been found. It appeared by this point that the police were coming to somewhat of a dead end. It's reported in Wales Online that police made a statement saying, South Wales Police can confirm that the team investigating the murder of Harry and Meghan Twos has been scaled down. The decision has been made because all lines of inquiry and forensic opportunities relating to the case have now been exhausted by investigators. However, it's important to stress that the inquiry has not been closed. We have kept the family of Harry and Meghan Twos fully updated on these developments and realise that they are deeply disappointed the case remains unsolved. In light of the current situation, it's important that the force now turns its attention to other unsolved crimes in South Wales, which may benefit from extra resources. This was obviously a disappointment for the Two's family, who had hoped that this reinvestigation would uncover new evidence. Both Cheryl and Jonathan expressed their disappointment at the time, and stated that they hoped more could be done to find the real killer. In 2011, the case was once again in the headlines, when it was suggested that the case may be looked at again after the conviction of John Cooper. Cooper had been convicted of four murders, Crucially, two were brother and sister, and the other two were a married couple. In 1985, he had attacked and killed siblings Richard and Helen Thomas in their farmhouse, and then in 1989, he had killed Peter and Gwenda Dixon on a coastal path in Pembrokeshire, after getting them to divulge the pin to their bank card. He shot the couple at point-blank range in the face with a sawn-off shotgun. He was also convicted of the rape of a 16-year-old girl in Milford Haven in 1996. Cooper was of interest to the investigators due to the similarity of the crimes to that of Harry and Meghan. He had killed two people together twice and on one occasion he had used a shotgun to do it. He was only found in 2011 due to a reinvestigation of the cases and a link to his DNA. Despite these possible links to Cooper, it would appear that nothing more has been found to link Harry and Meghan to him in any way. 2013 marked the 20-year anniversary of the murders. The case was again in the headlines as there were calls from Jonathan Jones's legal team, amongst others, to publish the findings of the reviews of the investigation that took place in 2000. It's reported in a BBC article that Jones's solicitor, Stuart Hutton, believed that the findings of the review should be published, saying, you need to know that the investigation is being carried out properly, as there may be other input. I'd like that published, and I would like the police to seriously let us know, all of us, what has happened with their investigation, and where they think their leads have gone bad. In response to these calls for the publication, an independent advisor who worked on the review, Professor Margaret Griffiths, rejected the calls to publish any papers on the case, saying that they may affect a future prosecution. She stated that new evidence may come to light as it's an unsolved case. This was another blow for the Two's family as they believed that more could have been done in the investigation and without the publication of the review, this could not be properly examined. Since 2013, there has not been much published about the murders and police have not commented on the status of the case. 
However, a police spokesman did tell the public that any new information would be thoroughly investigated if it was received. It's clear that this case had huge ramifications for the family in multiple ways. The wrongful conviction and the murders themselves. Jonathan and Cheryl have continued to push for reinvestigations and for the reviews of the police handling of the case. Harry's sister Olive, who was 90 in 2003, told the BBC about how it had affected the family, stating, To me, I haven't got much faith the way this was carried out. It's been 20 years, but it's 20 years every day. It's not only now. That's not going to be it. It's every day. Every day is a nightmare. Cheryl's life has been made a misery. It has ruined her and Jonathan's life. She misses her mother and father. Never a day goes by in these 20 years when I don't think of them. When I think of the two of them gone, they were robbed of life. It's clear that evidence and information about the murders is quite sparse, which has been a contributing factor to why progress has been slow over the years. There is not much physical evidence to go on, and just the theory that whoever had been in the house that day was invited in. Could this mean it was someone close to the couple, or just someone who looked trustworthy? Was Harry's stolen gun anything to do with the murders at all, or completely unrelated? It's difficult to know, however I'm hopeful that DNA may eventually solve this case, or perhaps someone coming forward with new information. I believe that the family's effort to keep this case in the public eye is admirable, and I really do hope that it pays off for them in the future, and justice is finally done for Harry and Meghan. If you know anything about the murders of Harry and Meghan Twos in 1993, please contact South Wales Police on 101. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I would first of all like to thank June's Journey for sponsoring this episode, and if you're interested in playing the game, which I'm sure you will love, then you can download it for free from the App Store or Google Play, or by clicking on the link in the show notes. If you want to learn more about the case, then I would recommend the episode about it called The Lan Harry Murders on the Murder Town podcast. As I've said before, I don't listen to episodes about cases I'm going to write about, so I haven't listened to this episode specifically. But I have listened to other episodes and have really enjoyed them. It's narrated by Ben from the They Walk Among Us podcast, which I know most of you will recognise. I will leave the link in the show notes. Thank you as always to our amazing patrons and to our newest patron, Hannah. I really appreciate all the support. If you want to access bonus episodes and early ad-free episodes, as well as stickers and shout-outs, have a look at the link in the show notes to what we offer. I also want to thank our five-star reviewer this week, Polly Aurea from Sweden. If you want to support us, reviews are a great way to do it. You can also follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. If you have any case suggestions, please feel free to tell me about them on social media or email me at theunseenpod at gmail.com. I hope to see you back here again next week, but until then, as always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. Thank you.